Welcome back, everyone. Things have been more than a little crazy recently, um, so I figured I would give some of my thinking about what's going on in markets. So before I really get into the markets bit, I just wanted to say that, look, obviously the whole situation sucks. Nobody wants this for the Ukrainians. Nobody wants the painful sanctions for the Russian people. Hopefully we can resolve this peacefully soon. And, you know, in an ideal world, the Kremlin would focus on improving Russian lives as opposed to worrying about neighbors. When I look at the economic situation in Russia, I find it difficult to believe that there's too much support for that from that perspective, let alone from a familial or general peace perspective. But anyway, hopefully the arbitrary nature of the claim of why Russia entered allows them to arbitrarily decide that enough has been done and leave peacefully. And uh, they can say what, what they want is a victory and Ukrainians can get freedom and hopefully that's how this resolves. So probably one of the craziest markets out there has been the energy complex. And I think this has really highlighted the strategic importance of energy security, having your own controlled, friendly supply of energy, uh, producing your own energy where possible, storing energy where possible, and, you know, really sucks that certain people have been shutting down reactors that are perfectly safe and can could have kept running for many, many more years because, you know, it makes more reliance on in and out renewables and importing a constant flow of more capital intensive and risk intensive energy. Now, one thing that was not on my bingo card for 2022 was talk of Germany possibly restarting nuclear reactors. Still seems far-fetched, um, just based on everything that they've kind of put into closing them, but hopefully they can do it. And that kind of ties into my thought on uranium in general, which is uranium is such a tiny market and what people decide the story will be can dwarf what the fundamentals dictate. So at this point, you know, I could talk about supply chains, transport of energy, SWIFT, or inventory in different places, or sentiment, or whatever I wanted. But the reality is, compared to you know, a arbitrary move in market sentiment in Sprott uh, Physical Uranium Trust, nothing matters. So, you know, I, I, there's a lot of nuance, but I don't know if anything matters as much as something that I think is unmeasurable. And I will add about the recent nearly incident fear-mongering type of thing. Again, in a different way, it I don't think it should be anything. I don't think it is anything. Um, but if people want to decide it is and make it something, well then, it could be. Now when it comes to oil, I need to give full props to the oil bulls that have been saying that OPEC doesn't have as much capacity as many were expecting. I, I mean, full props to them, and I'm being serious here. Um, I was hearing the story for four, five years, and I thought, okay, this isn't really a thing that's going to happen, but it was. And so when OPEC started actually undershooting expectations, that caught me off guard. I will admit that. That said, these 
high prices, call it 90, call it 80. 80 is a high price for oil. Let's not forget that. 100, 110, very high prices. Whatever we're at now, they are incentivizing more production. Now, that's not always um, permit-wise or geologically easy, but it is happening and it's happening slowly. Now, the thing is, with the Russia shock that we could see right now, that would create a new center of gravity. So you have the center of gravity when prices are too low and that shuts things in. That's not where we're at right now. You have the center of gravity that is the price that causes more production to come online that you can think of that as 60s, high 50s, low 70s, that, that type of center of gravity. But if we have a Russia shock, then we get to the next center of gravity, which is the price that it would take to destroy demand. And yes, this is a gradual process, but if you were to remove a significant piece of energy, it essentially crashes to the upside. And basically this hurts a lot of people financially and this will hurt the economy and that would more than likely cause some type of recession uh, if it indeed crashes to the upside by the Russia shock. Now, in time, supply would be able to respond. I don't know exactly how long it would take. I don't exactly know how that would come about in terms of um, if we are kind of stuck to the ceiling until we peel ourselves off with more supply or if the recession would break things first. I'm not really sure. But if we do get that type of shock, then, you know, I don't know how much higher oil can go. Um, that's not saying I don't think it'll go any higher. That's saying it could go, you know, it could go to 150, could go higher than that. But the higher we go on that type of shock, the less time I think we spend there because once this thing fixes itself or starts fixing itself, there is a lot of room where prices are still very high. And the other thing is, you know, you have all this talk about all these producers that are, you know, that they their balance sheets were impaired. They were struggling they couldn't really have they didn't have the funds to increase production now they do they really do and if you think oil is going to stay here for a while which it may may go higher then they have a ton of money that they can put to work now i'm sure some of it will go back to shareholders in terms of dividends and price dependent of the shares buybacks but at the same time i would think that the amount of money spent on on investment would increase. Now there are other forms of energy too, and that includes natural gas, which you know Russia has Europe by their throat, and Europe is hurting right now, even without the possibility of things getting worse there. So could this get worse there? Oh, yes. Um, Will it? I don't know. So in the US, there is very likely the possibility for more production, but again, transportation becomes a logistical issue. And coal, with coal, I mean, there are parts of the world that use coal as electricity, obviously, and the price of coal depends which uh, thing, but most of them are, uh, I think the word is astronomical right now. So there is a lot of parts of the world where energy has all of a sudden got extremely expensive. The next market that has been pretty crazy has been the 
foods and fertilizers market. And this has not been another market that's kind of had a string of unpredictable things happen. And I think it's important to distinguish when we're talking about fertilizers, which ones we're talking about, because there's different uh, dynamics that affect each of them. Now, the two that I find the most uh, interesting or noteworthy are nitrogen and potash. So the N and the K of the NPK. So nitrogen, my understanding is, should be just a matter of price. There's plenty of excess capacity around the world. And the price spike that we saw was really a function of kind of a, a number of things happening at the same time. But nitrogen is available, it's just a uh, high price because the kind of the higher, highest cost producers are using natural gas and in Europe. So if you need the highest cost production, you need the highest cost producers, and that is basically based off of European natural gas price. But in some markets, you might not need some of that production because there's other possibilities for production, particularly out of China. However, with coal doing what it is and energy prices as it is, it probably won't get much cheaper, if at all. Um, if if that is if the price of energy keeps being high. Now, when I say should just be a matter of price, I say that to, in order to make a distinction because there's a scenario where potash isn't like that. And that's because Belarus and Russia are very large global exporters. Now, Belarus had some sanctions and while I was hesitant to think that that would be necessarily a market breaking deal because I thought there was a possibility that they would be able to just, instead of shipping it out to the West, ship it out to the East and take it into Russia. And Russia could then trade with maybe China and then China could ship out. However, if Russia is going to be, uh, a problem to trade with and Belarus is going to be a problem to trade with the potash market is um, potentially problematic and with talks like what we've seen about Russia talking about shutting off exports of fertilizer if potash is included that could be problematic now some people will say yes but Nutrient has uh, has some capacity that they can bring online. Okay, yes, they do. They have the potential to bring on capacity, but they're in a bit of a pickle because on one hand, they cannot instantly bring it on. So it would take time. And, you know, this is not really a time issue. I mean, in terms of um, if, if there's a planting season in a few days, you know, a few weeks, a few months, uh, they can't bring on the added capacity quick enough to make a difference. The other problem is, and this was the case kind of before the Belarus issue, or as, as there was uncertainty around just the Belarus side, the problem they have is if they bring on all of their capacity and then the Belarus issue gets solved, then they go from making a lot of money in that division to probably like almost zero because the market would have enough capacity and the price would go back to the most desperate seller, which is approximately them because it's a very small market. And so they would go from making a lot in a tight market to making very little, if anything, and having added capacity that they would then have to cut back and have lost money on the deal. So if there was visibility around a prolonged shortage going out multiple years, this year, next year, going out next year, if there was a shortage, if they knew that there was no Russian potash going to be on the market, then they could add 
a fair bit of capacity. But the uncertainty is killing them. It's, and it's, it's might be hurting the market in the near future. But another interesting point when it comes to which countries have kind of sided which ways is that one of the com countries that hasn't necessarily been tough on Russia is India. And India imports is a big importer of fertilizer. Similarly, if we look at uh, fertilizer or potash particularly, it doesn't necessarily need to be applied every year. So I wouldn't say the market is definitely screwed. I would say there is a lot of uncertainty and the geopolitical situation is uncertainty on top of uncertainty. It would definitely be simple to simpler to be able to buy local at this time. It would definitely kind of feel better to be integrated. Um, but short term, long short term capacity isn't very flexible. Medium term, it might be, but uncertainty kind of works in the reverse order to that. Now. Going back to my prior call inflation, I said short of something crazy, I thought inflation would peak very soon. Well, this has kind of been the reason why I didn't say it's definitely going to peak very soon because this has been crazy. And look, I think, you know, a few things that are almost guaranteed out of this is one, a few prices of a few things are going higher Two, supply chains aren't going to get <laughs> that much better in the short term. It could f food price go up? Sure. Um, could energy price go up? I mean, look what's happening on both of them. And, you know, uh, while food price doubling isn't necessarily food price doubling, if you know what I mean, because there's packaging and all sorts of intermediaries getting it to the shelf. Um, so it's not it's not actually going to be as bad as it looks when you look at the, the price of the foods. It's still going to be a situation where more of the paycheck goes to the same few things. And that is in some ways inflation that, I mean, I'll, I'll get to why I say in some ways, but that's inflationary. Now, on the other hand, if people have, the same paycheck and it goes to more goes to the necessities then that means they can afford less and that is naturally deflationary for demand across the rest of the economy and so that could work towards fixing a few other things if there's less demand for those other things but i will point out that if we do get the scenario that i kind of described before for oil with the crash up not only will that slow the economy, which by the way is already kind of estimated to be growing in the zero point whatever percent uh, in real terms, as the inflation rate uh, or as, as the prices kind of crash upwards, if that happens, that will get worse. But what that also means is once it finds its limit, that's it. And from there, not only will things uh, stop inflating, assuming there's no stupid policy such as uh, stimulus to offset the higher energy prices type of thing, assuming there's no stupid policy, from there, it's not lower inflation, it's deflation from the ceiling, from if we crash upwards type scenario. And so from there, um, I think that only goes to, oh, look, obviously I'm, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm saying I was wrong about the prior um, call on inflation a few weeks ago, but I'm saying that effectively something similar will, should happen on a slightly delayed um, reaction time because prices, you know, if, if they spike because of this, they get 
basically very high, and then it's even harder for them to keep inflating, short of some stupid policy. But on the investment side of things, one thing I will say in basically all commodities is that producers have shown historic levels of restraint based on if if you look at what they might have been spending last time if prices were if margins were this wide much less has been spent this time and i think that there's an element of they know that some of this is supply chain they know that some of this uh, some of the, the demand spike is stimulus and temporary, so they haven't been going all out with investment. There's also probably some pipeline issues and things like that. But for however you want to frame the, the, the if this is a bull case or a bear case or the narrative or however you want to do it, um, this is just something I've noticed. And, you know, nobody wants to go back to 2016 or the industrial recession of 2019 or 2020 prices. That's not good for anyone. And so there, this cycle is being played defensively, but let's not forget, it is a cycle. On my personal portfolio side, I will say that I am pretty capital constrained with when it comes to, um, fresh money to put to work for new investments. I have very little investable capital unless I were to start selling things, which I don't really see any urgent need to. Um, I also could in theory have access to margin, but I won't, uh, but I don't feel like it at this at this time i th i see a, a a mountain of uncertainty and if if some prices get very attractive there's e stuff either within my portfolio or other things that i'm kind of watching kind of looking at um might be nibbling on but in terms of substantial or large real new positions i haven't really seen anything to take a huge bite out of again maybe a few things nibble here and there but not really um not really the capital or the um idea quality to add a new large position now if i were assessing my portfolio i would say it has been a complete mix and kind of surprisingly so there's some stuff that has been absolute i would say garbage other stuff has been kind of ignoring the noise and kind of going sideways and just kind of doing its own thing, which has been surprising considering the bifurcation in the market. And then there's the, the other side where some stuff has done surprisingly well or justifiably well, or the uh, fundamentals have really outperform my expectations and supporting the growth of the companies. But one thing I'm definitely trying to do at a time like this is focus on the fundamentals. Look, I, I know things are crazy. I know there's inflation fears. I know there's uh, energy going crazy and being part of that trade and it's going straight up. I know there's a bull case for gold and I know there's all sorts of things. And really what I'm trying to do is not trade the story, the narrative, the whatever. I'm trying to focus on fundamentals a few years out. What's an attractive risk reward? What, what companies could be worth a few times what it is today? What's not going to go down a lot? What could go up far more than it can go down? try and focus on fundamentals. So overall, I think there's just such a immense level of uncertainty right now that makes a lot of things, even if you believed in the ability to model something like a market um, in, in immense detail, I, I don't think you're able to do that because, especially right now, because of all of this um, these extreme details that you would need to know that could 
side strongly to to the left or strongly to the right and you, you just can't know and that makes things extremely uncertain now if you wanted to hedge some type of tail risk scenarios i i wouldn't have necessarily have a problem with that if you believe your portfolio needed it but i'm still not sure also if if you wanted to you know i know i can't necessarily swing trade these things i can't uh day trade swing trade that type of thing it doesn't necessarily work well for me now i do know that some of my portfolio was luckily um in a place where this type of uh, volatility could benefit some of it now of course in other places there were some disastrously poor performers that needed to be carried by those that benefited from the volatility but overall i think that you don't want to be I mean, I don't know what anyone's portfolio is like, but you wouldn't want to be like throwing around, completely changing the portfolio um, to chase what's happening right now. Um, I, the way I look at it is I do small changes around uh, the edges. Most of it has been pretty similar for a while. I might add a little bit of something or take off a little bit of something, but mostly small shifts. So in conclusion, in addition to the not investment advice ramble that I always give, I will say that I know that some of the things I've said in this video maybe seem concerning to people, um, particularly food and energy wise, but I also don't think that most of the people watching this video at least, and for um, my personal situation, I don't believe that it is I do not believe that it is by any means extremely concerning. Um, the market will work out uh, a lot of this stuff. You know, the, the prices um, going up will tell the farmers what to produce. And, you know, there's going to be crops switching from canola to wheat, that type of thing. So the fact that this moves before a planting season is very helpful for sorting it out. Now, can the prices go up? Absolutely. Can uh, availability in some regions be perhaps a bit restricted? Possibly. But I don't, I, I, I'm not panicking. I don't think there's going to be reason to panic. So I hope that reassures people. Um, to some degree and in the end uh, last thing I want to say is I wish everyone everywhere peace until next time and beyond